Welcome to the Exam Room Podcast brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I'm the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for watching and downloading in more than 150 countries around the world and making the Exam Room one of the most consumed nutrition podcasts on the planet. Today, we are talking about something that we've actually never spoken about here on the show in depth. Today, we are talking about a groundbreaking pilot study that looks at the effect of a plant-based diet on recovery from substance abuse. Is there a connection there? Could it possibly be beneficial? Well, I can think of no two better people in the world to discuss this than the people who were involved in the infinite study. Let's welcome back to the exam room, Adam said the plant-based addict, and for the very first time, Dr. Tara Kemp. Thank you guys so much for being here. Hey, Thanks so much thank for you so much us. for having us. Yeah. Here's the score. I was looking up some statistics before we got going here today. And this is from SAMHSA, uh, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. According to their estimates, which were released at the beginning of the year, 46.3 million people in the U.S. 12 or older meet what is known as the DSM-5 criteria criteria for having a substance abuse disorder. So that's 16 and a half percent of the population. That's a lot of people who are struggling out there. Adam, I know you were one of them. This yes. study that you've put together, I mean, this is about as personal as it gets for you, my friend. Yes, it is. Um, I'm, I'm a person in long-term recovery. Um, I, I uh, in 2012, survived suicide after struggling for 10 years with substance use disorder. Um, I was... Uh, nearly 350 pounds at the time. I had diabetes and heart disease and a whole host of psychological diagnoses. And as a result of checking into treatment and, re and receiving these diagnoses, I had a really interesting uh, moment of, I guess you could call it clarity, where what I was trying to think about was what, what, what did I want to do? Did I want my path to look like trying the best I could to abstain from use of my substances and in the attempt and in the process of doing that, hopefully end up living a life that felt like a, an exciting place to be. Or should my efforts be put somewhere else? Should they be in what I told myself then, which was, could I reverse engineer the experience of feeling fully alive? That if I was to completely reorganize my life, my priorities, my values, could I create a life that was such an exciting and safe place to be, plus a sense that my future was an equally exciting and safe place to be. If I could do that, would use become a lot less necessary? And so that's really that's really the basis of of the work that I do now and in, in the in the hopes that this study is going to inform that. And your story obviously has a happy ending, and I'm sure yes. that you were very much hoping to replicate those results with the infinite study. Um, Dr. Kemp, let me ask you, how did you first uh, get in touch with Adam? And did you guys come up with this idea of doing the study together? Yeah, so I definitely have to credit Adam primarily with the idea for this study. Um, Adam and I had been friends and colleagues for a few years prior to the start of the infinite study. And I was in my PhD program working at a university with a team of people who were um, had a knowledge of plant based nutrition. And Adam came to me and was like, you know, I have this idea and I have um, a facility that wants to work with us. And I would love for you to be the lead researcher and to help put this study together. And that was such an honor and such an exciting experience to have. And um, so that was kind of how it all started. We met up, he flew to Flagstaff where I was living at the time. Um, Northern Arizona University is where I was doing my PhD program. And it was just a bunch of meetings, a bunch of masterminding between us and a couple of other researchers who were on the team. Um, we flew out to Austin to actually go to the recovery center itself and to train the staff there to do the different measures to understand um, the logistics of the study. And it's it's been such a fun ride. Um, it was a long, beautiful <laughs> process, um, but that's how it all got started. Um, Adam and I were both... Um, 
we both had been very passionate about mental health and seeing the world of addiction and substance use disorder. Um, I come from a background of more of the eating side of things and disordered eating. And in both cases, just feeling like the narrative was not, um, was not being portrayed in a way that was most accurate or helpful to the people who were seeking out support and recovery. And so that's that's where a lot of this started was just a lot of conversations between the two of us on those topics. And then, you know, Adam brought it to life and turned it into, um, you know, a full research study. And I'm so glad that we're here today. So let me ask you this, going into the study, what was your hypothesis? I would imagine like, obviously you're very familiar with the profound effects that a plant-based diet can have on someone's health. I think that, you know, there, I mean, was it hard not to look at this through rose colored lenses here, or was it possible that you, you went into it with an open mind? Like, let's just see, let's just see, because yeah. we've really had no data on this yet. Yeah, that's a really great question. And of course, I would say, you know, it's hard not to look at, it was hard for me not to look at my own experience through recovery and say, oh, well, we're going to get, we're going to get data that, that basically uh, substantiates everything that I went through in, you know, with evidence. And, but at the same time, really being incredibly open-minded because what the, we had to think about what were we actually trying to measure and what were we actually trying to discover and like what Tara had alluded to earlier, the, the, the conversation about addiction recovery, uh, even to today, and certainly when, when the study was going on, is just not an accurate representation of what addiction really is and what's actually taking place in the world and why we have such a significant percentage of the population struggling with this, this situation. And so what I really wanted to do was to identify part of the things that comprise a significant amount of what it is to build your life, right? So nutrition plays a role in how you organize your day and how you organize your life, how you organize a sense. And I say this a lot, how you can gain a sense of the, the trajectory that your future is going. And I really wanted to measure in some way, shape or form, the impact of this one specific variable on a multitude of variables that can, that can either predict or help us predict long-term recovery. So for example, the, the, t the traditional narrative that we have around addiction recovery and an addiction right now is that, that addiction is a disease, that addiction is pathology, that it is rooted in um, the idea that what we would call a dependency model, whereas a person starts using, and as a result of that use, they become addicted to these chemical hooks, that there's some kind of genetic component that makes them this way, and that they become addicts, then they, and as a result of becoming an addict, which is what they will define as actually, you've always been an addict, and the reason why you got addicted to the substance is because you used the substance, and now you can't stop using the substance. And the traditional story of that individual is that at a certain point in time, their life will become unmanageable, they'll check into a treatment facility, and that treatment facility will do their best to separate them from the substance and get them to accept and own the identity of an addict who cannot in any way, shape or form allow this substance back into their life. And in order to be successful, what you have to do is abstain from use. And the longer you can do it, the better, and we'll call that success. Hopefully as a result of that, your life will get better, fantastic. I have a very, very, um, strong opinion that that is not accurate. And when you look at what's actually taking place in the real world, when you look at what's going on with substance abuse, when you look at those who are struggling with substance abuse, that story is not accurate to what's happening to these people. First and foremost, we have to answer a very specific question. When someone is struggling with substance use, the people who are observing that person struggling with substance use will ask a very, what seems like a very reasonable question. What they're going to ask is, why won't you stop? How do we get you to stop using? That simply by any means necessary, if we can sever them and divorce them from their substance use, that is the same thing as recovering a life worth living. That's not actually a very valuable question to ask. A much more valuable question to ask would be, 
why and how does this person's use make sense to them? Why and how for this person does using, even though they know using is not going to create a future that's safe, it's not going to create positive changes in their life, why does it make so much sense that, that for them, it seems like the right and safest thing to do? If we can answer that question, we have a much greater opportunity of understanding addiction and helping this individual to recover. The number one reason, in my opinion, the number one reason why people use is because their life as it is right now is not a place that they would like to be. It's typically uh, an experience of pain. There's probably shame. There's probably a sense of fear that their life as it is, is too painful a place to be. And so they would wish not to be present in their life while at the same time having a sense that their future is an equally and if not more unsafe place to be. When you have these two factors going on, the person who's struggling is okay with compromising their future by engaging in substances that they know are dangerous to them. Number one, because the use relieves them of the experience of being present in their day. And number two, they don't mind compromising their future because to them, their future isn't a place they'd like to be anyways. So what addiction recovery should really be rooted in is helping this individual reestablish behavior patterns that help them create a sense that their body, that their life, that their social community is a safe place to be, not just today, but that also there's a sense that now for the first time maybe ever, tomorrow is an equally and potentially even more safe, more exciting place to be. And that's somewhere that, that they would like to get to. They're likely to become rooted in behaviors that they bond and connect with because it makes them feel like their body is safe for the first time, that their environment is safe for the first time, that their social community is safe for the first time, and that their future is safe for the first time. And nutrition has a role to play in all of that. That is a, that's a lot to put on nutrition shoulders there. Um, and I'm, it makes me wonder how in the world you guys began to even set this study up so you could, you know, really give a good hard look at what effect nutrition, nutrition education could play in this recovery process. So I guess, Dr. Kemp, my question to you is how did you guys wind up setting up this study? How was it designed? Yeah. So what we ended up doing is we had two groups. Um, the intervention group and the control group, as you typically see. And we allowed participants to self-select because that provides ecological validity, you know, real world experience of when you're at a recovery center, we didn't think that it was realistic and the recovery center itself didn't think that it was going to be um, supportive or conducive to the participants and their patients' experience to have them forced into something when they have so many of their rights already being stripped away. Um, and so we allowed self-selection into a plant-based group or a control group. The plant-based group um, was provided whole food plant-based meals um, for the first three weeks of the study. So when they were in the inpatient environment, and then for the last seven weeks of the study, it was a 10 week um, experiment for the last 10 weeks of the study. They were either in, um, like a middle ground area where they were living with other uh, people who had gone through the program or they were living on their own. And in both of those cases, they were preparing their own meals. Um, the control group was eating for the first three weeks what the recovery center provided, which we found out later when we went to visit the recovery center that this recovery center was actually quite advanced in what they were providing to um, to their patients. Most recovery centers do not have quite the quality of meals. So that was beneficial for the patients, not so beneficial for seeing like huge differences. Give us an us. example. Like, so what were they serving? What's the typical menu there? So they were serving, you know, like um, chicken breast with uh, like a, you know, a typical like grilled chicken breast or roast chicken breast with, you know, maybe some green beans and then like a rice peel off type of thing. You know, your typical like vegetable starch meat um, right. type of meal. Were you expecting maybe hamburgers, fries, pizza, comfort foods like that? Uh, yeah. When, when, I mean, Adam can speak more to this, but when Adam was in recovery, you know, his experience was much different. And a lot of recovery centers do not have yeah. the same quality of ingredients. We just happened to work with a, 
a space where they just, their integrity is so high. They're doing literally everything possible to uh, promote the, the treatment of, of their clients. And that's why they were interested in a study like this, because they, they want to do, they are willing to try anything possible to, to help out their clientele. So. Yeah. Um, you know, my, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Adam. No, Adam, I would oh, no. love to know what your menu yeah. was like. Yeah. So in rehab, the rehab facility that I went to is actually a very upscale rehab facility. Um, and it, it was actually much larger than the rehab facility that we, that we uh, work with in the study. Um, there were anywhere from up to 110 people living at the rehab facility, but the, the meals were never, they weren't, you know, there's always fruits and vegetables. There was always um, uh, some kind of greens that was being served. There was a salad bar, but of course everything was focused on, you know, the meat and the dairy and the desserts and the, the, the high calorie, high fat, high sugar snacks, because they wanted to create a sense of relief. You know, they wanted to be a sense that, you know, three times a day, you were going to get some kind of familiar, comforting experience that could help you feel supported through recovery, which I, I, I can appreciate and I can recognize the value in that. However, the meals were not any way, shape, or form designed to be intentionally structured for you to continue to use as part of your recovery. It was just breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Hope you like what you got. It wasn't how is breakfast, lunch, and dinner going to be a part of your life moving forward? And how can we use it in a way that reinforces and establishes and roots into your, your life a sense of wanting to repair things. And I think that that's, that, that that's something that needs to change. And there was, I believe also the nutrition education component here that I think you're kind yeah. of, you're, you're talking about here that came with the study. What kind of classes were you really offering people as they were going through this process? Yeah. Right, so Tara. it was, um, <clears throat> Classes that were essentially providing your traditional understanding of, you know, what is a plant-based diet? Why is this helpful for you? Giving them an understanding in the same way that when you go through like the 21 day kickstart or you watch the documentaries, um, they watch documentaries like Forks Over Knives, um, like uh, Cowspiracy, things that help them to see um, or Game Changers, I think was one. So helping them to really understand what are the wider effects of a plant-based diet. Um, and the control group also had nutrition education. So they were also under, or getting uh, nutrition education around, you know, why is it important to eat a more whole foods, less processed foods diet. Um, we had a dietitian who did video lectures on different topics related to nutrition and how those influence your body and your experience in life as a whole. So both groups were getting, um, an educational experience to expand their understanding of why nutrition is important, not only for their physical health, but for their longevity and their life as a whole. But the, the, the education wasn't identical, right? So the completely plant-based group got all of the documentaries, the control group got, I don't know, less than that, or, or just something a little bit different. Yeah. They had the same a number of hours and we tried to make it so that both groups were getting information on why their dietary path that they were receiving was important to their overall experience. Gotcha. Yeah. We, we, we work with a, uh, a nutrition group, um, out of Florida that designed a curriculum for the number of hours and weeks that would match the, the plant-based group. And it was designed to reinforce the benefits of a diet that included meat, eggs, and dairy. Um, and so that we could, we could get a sense that how does nutrition and education about your specific nutrition pattern improve your opportunity to see the value in the behaviors that you're engaging in? Does it prolong the existence of that diet moving forward? Um, we, you know, like I said, you really want to control for, for every single thing. If we just gave the control group the food and we gave the treatment group the food plus education, then we couldn't say, well, how do you know it wasn't just the education that did it? Gotcha. And uh, Dr. Kepp, at what point were you able to tell a difference between the outcomes of the two groups? Yeah. So something about addiction recovery is that for both groups, we saw increases in all of the different measures. So we were measuring 
um, at baseline week three and week 10, uh, resilience, anxiety, depression, self-esteem, spirituality. Um, we also were doing blood tests and microbiome samples, which those results haven't been published yet. Um, but from, you know, the, the psychological health side, the mental health side of things, we were taking those measures. And for both groups, because they're coming in at such a level in the same way that if you were doing a study on diabetes or heart disease or blood pressure, you know, if both groups are receiving this intense intervention, you're going to see benefits for both groups. But what we did see in terms of a difference is that when they were out of the inpatient experience, so during the inpatient experience, as I said, you are getting, as Adam said, like fed a meal. It's like you go up to the counter and they give you a plate and that's what you have to eat. Um, they're also having all of, like I said, the all day intensive. So what we saw is when they got to the outpatient experience where they were um, purchasing and cooking their own meals was that the intervention group, the plant-based group actually maintained their healthy diet for a longer period of time. They actually adhered to the diet um, when they were on their own, making their own decisions. So that was really exciting to see. Um, we also saw that over time, the plant-based group had higher resilience and self-esteem. And so that was also really exciting to find. And some people see self-esteem as a component of resilience, but both have been found to be very important in long-term sobriety, long-term recovery. Can, and yeah, so actually, that was- Can you guys define resilience for us? You, you've you each used that term a number of times. So, yeah. I mean, I know I could look it up in the dictionary, but what does it mean in terms of the study here? Resilience is essentially the ability to overcome- challenges. So when you're in the face of a mental challenge of um, a life challenge that you're able to not only overcome that challenge, but then get back to where you were and keep moving forward. Were yeah. they, were you able to kind of chronicle whatever obstacles the people in the study were encountering that would lead them to be resilient? No. So with, there's different scales. So like for depression, like the PHQ-9 is the, the standardized depression scale um, for anxiety, the GAD-7. And so, you know, I know that none of these acronyms make sense to anyone, but for resilience, there's a scale called the Connor Davidson Resiliency Scale. And it's a number of questions that, you know, ask someone something and they, you know, respond. And that, when you take all the questions together, it lets you know their level of resiliency. And it's basically a self-reflective scale. So it's helping them to determine whether or not they feel like in the face of challenges, they're able to um, maintain that self-esteem, maintain that sense of um, empowerment. Yeah. And, and, the, and the scale is a, is a universally validated scale of measurement. It's actually used in, in uh, testing the, the impact of specific PTSD treatments. And so it's a, it's a, it's a valid validated scale of measurement. So this isn't just something that we put together. This is a, uh, uh, a, a, a scale that anyone who's trying to measure resilience would use this. So I guess here's my big question. It's, it's the one that I think you're trying to answer with the study is, I mean, is the plant-based diet having a legitimate physiological effect that is enabling somebody to thrive as they go through the rehab process? Or is it the fact that we know that with a plant-based diet, you tend to just overall, in a lot of cases, feel a little bit better about yourself. You're doing something that perhaps you thought you could never do in your entire life. And that gives you some confidence. And it's, it's more of a psychosomatic kind of a deal. So is it yeah. physiological or is it you know, all, all up in the brain. Yeah. So here's what I'd say that we can say based on the findings in this study, a plant-based diet at best is offering clients an opportunity to experience greater self-esteem and resilience and develop a relationship with food that feels empowering and supportive to their recovery goals. Goals at worst it's neutral there were no negative effects seen here. And so for someone who already has an interest or an inclination towards a plant-based diet, it's absolutely um, an opportunity for them to not only provide their body with a flood of better um, vitamins, minerals, nutrients to support their body in that recovery process, because as we know, substance use disorder is associated with deficiencies 
uh, most people who enter treatment, um, the last, whether depending on what study you're looking at, between 50 to 70% of people who enter treatment are suffering with some sort of deficiency. And so we know that a whole food plant-based diet is just flooding your system with all of those good nutrients that you need. Um, and at the psychosocial level, it's something that can be of great benefit if it's something that someone is inclined towards because it can create greater self-esteem. It can create a sense of connection to oneself. It can create a greater sense of connection to the world around them. All of these things are associated with long-term recovery. And so at best, you know, it's something that has a huge and powerful benefit to someone's experience. And at worst, it's neutral. There's no negative effects of eating a plant-based diet if it's something that someone is naturally inclined to do. And I guess, Adam, does it even matter whether there is something physiological that's going on or if it's more of a placebo effect? As somebody who's in long-term recovery yourself, the fact mm -hmm. is one way or another, it works. So does it even matter why in this case? For me, it does. Um, for me, it does because I want to be accurate. I'm a person who who likes to be accurate with their language and likes to be accurate with what I tell somebody and, and accurate. I want to, to create accurate information that can inform better decision making for someone who's in recovery. Um, uh, I think that does it require a person to be entirely plant exclusive? Likely no. And I'm going to say that with as a person who is plant exclusive for ethical reasons. Does it require you to be plant exclusive? Likely no. Um, but here's what I think is actually what, what's taking place here. And this is really important, especially for people who are struggling with, with a substance use disorder, is that they're, they're fighting something that's really profound and really powerful. Number one, they probably don't understand why and how their life got to be the way it is right now, where they're at that point where they want to check into recovery or they need to check into recovery. Their life has gotten so disordered to where every valuable behavior in their life and every valuable connection in their life has been pushed aside to make room for specifically and only use. When do I use? What do I use? How do I use? How much do I use? So everything that makes that made their life meaningful has been pushed aside for this one priority. And they don't know why. They likely don't know why and how it got there. And when they look outside of their window and they look outside of their house and they look at their friends, it looks like none of them are dealing with that problem. They seem and feel like they're the only person within their own world of people that they know who's dealing with such a profound problem. That's very difficult. It's a very difficult thing to fight against where if someone, if now this person would say, man, I got a problem that nobody seems to have a problem with. So if I just stop using, no one around me is going to give me anything, any sense that this is worthy of applause because they already don't have this problem at all. To them, it's not an effort to give this up. So this is not worthy of applause. Why I think nutrition and recovery matters so much is that you're, when you're fighting against this kind of ego trap, having to make an additional uh, behavior change that the rest of the world might see as a sacrifice, right? So if you look outside, you go downtown, you can look around, it seems like, it seems like most people don't really have a good understanding of nutrition. A lot of people sort of present as someone who, who, who might need some help with their nutrition. And so if you check into treatment and you make this seemingly additional sacrifice, so I'm going to start taking care of my body with a plant predominant or plant exclusive diet. And over the course of time, let's say three to 10 weeks, you start to notice that for the first time, seems like you begin to figure out how to take care of your body with nutrition. And again, when you look outside and you look at the world around you, it seems like now for the first time, you may have figured out something that most people don't know how to do or know how to do easily, which is to take care of your body, have a body that feels safe to be in today in a sense that it's going to be even safer tomorrow. And you did that while getting sober. Now getting sober is worthy of applause because you did it in a situation when dealing with something that most people would already look at as a sacrifice you figured it out, you took care of yourself, you created a sense that tomorrow is going to be a safe place to be, while also removing this incredibly difficult disordered behavior pattern that beforehand, no one really, anyone would have said, well, I'm, I'm glad you got sober. But it, it creates a different sense of what recovery looks like. 
it creates a different sense of what recovery means. It creates a sense of, oh, this person, what they did is they didn't stop using. They completely reorganized their life. They've completely reorganized the way that they move through the world. I wouldn't even know how to start doing that. That is fantastic. This is so worthy of applause. And what an incredible sense of value and knowledge that they might have. If I get into trouble, I might now see them as someone I would like to have in my life. Now, not only are you a person in recovery who's taking charge of your health, created a sense of safety, you also have a sense of value within a community of shared respect. These three things, you cannot put a price on that. That is unbelievably valuable in recovery. And in fact, I think it's the reason why you saw esteem levels rise in the plant-based group is because it gives you a sense that you have a level of esteem amongst your group, uh, group of, uh, share, uh, of community where they see inherent value in you beyond just giving up using, because it's not what you did. You didn't give up using. You replaced using with things most people haven't figured out how to do well. That's really powerful. Bro, and if it if it you, helps, to, oh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to say, you just composed an opus. That was <laughs> a beautiful response, and I think it really embodies everything that this study, you know, could the the implications that it could have for people. I mean, that was, bro. <laughs> yes. <Thank you. laughs> We're all waiting for the TED talk. Yeah, for <laughs> thank you. Right? Can I get an amen, uh, Dr. Kemp? What what is it that you were saying? Well, I was going to say, um, in case it helps to make the connections a little bit more clear for anyone who is still questioning this whole connection between diet and addiction, um, two studies that I think that really for me, like brought to light the foundation for what we were asking here and that show it quite well. Um, Cowan and Devine or Devine um, in 2008, and then I think the second one was 2013, did studies where they were looking at men in early recovery and what was happening for them with food and diet. And what they found was that very often in recovery, someone's experience, sorry, I'm not looking directly at the screen because it's like just me. Um, someone's experience in early recovery is that there's a lot of disordered eating that occurs, whether that's binge eating or restrictive eating, um, as someone's substance of use is first taken away, they haven't yet been taught the coping skills in order to get the coping skills that you need to navigate experiences without using, um, whatever your substance of choice was as that coping mechanism you haven't been taught those tools yet. And so a lot of people do turn to food because it's an easy thing that gives you that similar response within your body. And so, you know, binge eating, overeating, um, high sugar co um, consumption, like all of those things are very common. In addition, when someone is using, when someone is in a state of addiction, their substance basically is the way that they structure their day. It's like, when do I use next? Okay. And then I do this and then I use next and then I do this and then I use next and food for someone can really provide a lot of structure and it can be a new healthy thing. It can also be unhealthy. As I said, there's a lot of uh, disordered eating behaviors that are associated with the recovery process, but it can also be something that's really healthy where if someone has, you know, they've been trained, they've been given that nutrition education experience to have a healthy relationship with it it can be a really wonderful thing to add structure to their day. Okay, I'm having breakfast and I'm doing with the, this with the intention of taking care of myself. Okay, now I'm having lunch and I'm doing this with the intention of taking care of myself. It's, it's a new thing to place that attention to and that focus and that can either happen in a negative way or it can happen in a positive way. And so that was one of the things that we were looking at leading into this study. Um, and I will just say, you know, we interviewed all of the participants who went through the study. So we not only have their like quantitative numbers and, and data points, but we also have their qualitative, um, their stories and their experiences. And that's something that I um, just have so much love for, because I feel like you really get the whole picture in that way. And so when when it comes to the self-esteem, people were saying things like, oh, my gosh, like I feel healthier. I have more energy. I feel stronger. Um, you know, I, I'm gaining self-esteem because I feel more capable in my life or even just the fact of some people who joined the study were like, you know what, similar to what Adam said, they're like, if I'm going to come here and I'm doing this with the intention of starting over, 
Like, I'm just going to overhaul everything. I'm going to try this thing and overhaul everything. There were people in our study who this was their third or fourth time through treatment. And they were like, okay, like, I want to find anything I can do to make this the time that sticks. And when they did that, there was a sense of self-esteem that just came from sticking to something that mm -hmm. just came from saying, I'm going to do this new thing. And when they did it and it was like, okay, now it's been one week, it's been two weeks, it's been three weeks, it's been 10 weeks. And I'm still doing this thing that I never would have thought that I could do. And here I am doing it. And so that can bring a lot of self-esteem in addition to the fact that, you know, they were getting the nutrition education experience of not only how good this was for them. So you feel good just doing something good for yourself and taking care of yourself in a way that you never have before, but also knowing the influence on the world around you, knowing that this is better for the environment, knowing that you're no longer causing harm. Um, another thing that came up in a number of interviews for people that was tied into the self-esteem was, and I don't know if this was just something that the recovery center that the treatment center itself talked about. Um, and that's why it came up in a number of interviews, but this idea of not living in excess, like no longer, you know, living in ways that you are taking from places that you don't need to, and just really living simply and giving your body and yourself and your life exactly what it needs. And I feel like, Adam, maybe you can speak more to this. I know that you had a similar experience in wanting to do that post recovery. Yeah. Um, but anyways, these are just some of the things that came up for people in explaining, you know, why it felt so good, because it was like, oh, I'm doing something that is good for my body, that is good for the planet, that is good for sentient beings. It was like this, in the same way that so many of us feel so good about the way that we eat, you know, it was giving them something that had a sense of purpose. It was giving them something that made them feel good about who they were because coming into recovery, coming into treatment, you, most people do not feel good about themselves. People do not want to be an addict. And so to give them something where they not only are shifting their relationship with their body and themselves saying, I'm doing this thing to take care of myself, but to also say, and I'm doing something good for the world around me really led to that sense of self-esteem. And that's the piece that came through in the interviews. Um, which I loved. So anyways, I digress. Yeah. Adam, you know, you it, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, minimalism uh, became a part of my life after recovery. Um, and uh, it really, it, it became uh, a, an act of simplicity as a way of moving through the world. Um, rather than I need all these things in order to make my life interesting. Now this is from my own perspective, but rather if I can make my environment, meaning the world, the, the place where I live and the things that I do so simple, so obvious and so easy and attractive to do, I get to have a more exciting way of living, right? The things that I can engage in, the people that I can engage with, the future that I get to move towards, that becomes a much more exciting place to be rather than having things to distract myself from whatever may be going on in my life. And I think this is really important because when we talk about addiction, when we talk about addiction recovery, the goal always seems to be around the perfect of abstinence or abstaining perfectly and permanently from use. And I can understand why that is such a focus because I know how scary addiction looks when you're at the end of it. And I know how dangerous using in any amount early in recovery actually can be. And I completely agree that abstinence, abstinence should be a part of early recovery. But to say that recovery and the success of one's recovery should be determined by how perfectly and how long they're abstaining from their use isn't a very valuable and accurate way of looking at recovery. I think that recovery should be about how well you've been able to really reorganize your life and connect yourself back to what it is to those meaningful and loving bonds in life that give you the experience of feeling so fully alive and wanting to be so fully present in your life that use becomes far less necessary. So being able to create a sense that yourself, uh, a bond with yourself, both physically and emotionally is a safe place to be that you want to show up and be present for that you have people in your life who are a safe place to be with and that mean something to you and you wanna show up and be present for every single day, that you have developed or are in the process of developing a purpose that you can share with other people in a safe and meaningful way that you wanna show up and be present for every single day. All of these things creating a sense that your future 
is a safe and meaningful place to be that you want to continue to get up and be present in your life and work for it. When that is your day-to-day -day experience, using is not a necessary part of it because using will remove you from the ability to be present in those bonds and connections in your life that is moving you in the direction that you want to go. Will you use? Maybe. It might be a seldom convivial experience. It might be a toast of champagne on, at a wedding. It might be a, you know, a, a, a a, a, a wine toast at a, at a ceremony, it may be something like that, but it's not going to be for the purpose of escapism or distraction or in a sense that I need this because my life isn't where I want to be. If we look at addiction as a way of helping somebody redesign the meaningful experience of being alive, that person will feel a lot less need for the presence of substance in their life. Is that easy? No. Do I have a perfect blue, blueprint and roadmap to doing that? No. But I'm hoping that the work that Tara and I have done aids in creating the opportunity for an individual to really start to do that thing. Yeah. And Dr. Kemp, I guess, given what Adam said and what you have seen with the study, uh, the pilot study here, what is your hypothesis in terms of how this intervention will affect somebody's chances for relapse? I would say that for someone who, like I said, has an inclination towards a plant-based diet already, I'm not going to say that, oh, you know, someone who comes into treatment and, you know, has no desire to eat a plant-based diet, that it's going to be this meaningful experience for them that is going to lead them to not have that relapse. But in the cases where someone does have an inclination towards it or does feel a desire to try it out and they do find that connection through it, it can be a means, you know, it's not like the plant-based diet is the be all end all. And again, this is speaking specifically to like the psychosocial effects of it. Um, in terms of the actual physical benefits, we know that someone will get incredibly healthier, that they will have higher intakes of all of those vitamins and minerals that um, they often come in with those deficiencies of, and that it can definitely benefit the body in becoming healthier. Um, and let me, let me ask you this. Um, were you able to break down the results of this study based off of the various substances that uh, the participants were using? Because I'm assuming that you had alcohol in there. You may have had somebody using cocaine, opioids, whatever the case may be. Was there a difference depending on the substance? You know, we tried to do that breakdown based on different substances, but for a couple of reasons, we ended up not reporting on those differences. Number one, most people were using multiple substances. Mm. Um, most people were using, you know, opiates and alcohol or heroin and opioid or just, you know, there was a lot of overlap. Um, and we also didn't see different, many, much difference based on whether someone was you know, strictly an alcoholic or whether they were using other substances. Um, we just, we didn't see any big differences in outcomes based on those measures. Um, <clears throat> but I can totally understand why it would be a question. And it is something that we looked into at first. Uh, um, yeah. But, you know, uh, to, to answer what you were saying or you were asking before, you know, I think that we know that, you know, spirituality is super tied to um, more optimal recovery outcomes and long-term sobriety outcomes. Um, that's why the AA program has become what it is and why it is such a go-to. And um, so, you know, having that, uh, basically what I think that this study is starting to show, and obviously we need um, further studies, further research, um, looking at, you know, other variables. But what I think that this this shows is that a plant-based diet for those who inclined who are inclined towards it or open to it can be a means to developing different traits and characteristics that are associated with longer and more sustainable recovery outcomes. And if it, if a plant-based diet is something that gives someone that sense of purpose, that sense of connection, that sense of self-esteem, then it's something that absolutely can benefit their long-term recovery and provide better outcomes. 
I guess my final question for you is this, Dr. Kemp, um, this being a pilot study, and you already mentioned that there was more to come, including the microbiome, which I, I think is going to be absolutely fascinating to see those results. Um, where does the research go from here? What are the next steps here? Yeah, so based on the research that we already have, um, we have three more manuscripts that we want to write from just this. We collected so much data. Um, so we want to do one on more of the physical health outcomes. We want to do one specifically on the qualitative interviews and then one on the microbiome. So those are to come. Um, it's a long process, but those are in the early stages and, and getting to work on those. Um, I think that for future research, we would love to see um, studies with more participants and to be um, <clears throat> with those more participants, we can, you know, statistically power even more for certain outcomes. Um, and I would also love to, to have a better extended follow-up to assess the long-term effects of healthy diet and nutrition education within treatment. Are you able to maintain contact with any of the participants? Um, we do have their contact information. So that's something that hasn't been developed yet in terms of uh, further research with this particular population. But who knows that that could be an exciting development. Um, and we have a good relationship with the treatment center. So basically, there's no specific plans for anything beyond this study yet. But um, we're open to it and excited about it. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. And Adam, how many participants were in this study? There were 30. Um, yeah, that's a pretty good sample. So um, we launched the study January of 2020, uh, which means we ran into COVID. So we uh, had a, a little bit of a hindrance in capturing the population that we did. And we knew we wanted to run the study for a year. And so we were glad to get 30 participants into the study. Uh, would we have been able to get more had COVID not happened? Absolutely, yes. Does the data, is the data that we captured on this population incredibly valuable? Did it create findings that we hadn't seen before? Yes, it did. And um, what I think is so important is what Tara had alluded to is, and I think this is the biggest, probably the biggest thing that came out of the study is, at best, a plant-based diet increases resilience and self-esteem in recovery. At worst, it's neutral. There is absolutely no reason why, if a person is interested in adopting a plant-based diet in recovery, that a plant-based diet shouldn't be seen as a valuable and potentially better opportunity for nutrition to aid recovery over time. That is huge. That is a first of its kind discovery. Um, we're really excited about it. I'm profoundly uh, proud of it. I know Tara is incredibly proud of it, and we are going to continue to work on developing data that we can continue through these other manuscripts and and, and continue to pursue the impact of uh, nutrition as a tool in recovery. And, yeah. and we had 33. 33. Yeah, 33. <laughs> 33. 33. Which, All right. Which I'll just say, you know, um, like Adam said, this was during the pandemic that this happened. So that definitely influenced things. And also working with this population is just, um, it can just be difficult. You know, we had 48 people actually consent to the study, but then you know, people don't fully follow study protocols. And so they have their, you know, data is dropped or um, a lot of people just leave without, you know, they um, counter to, you know, basically against medical advice um, or they lose insurance coverage. And so they, they leave, and we don't have their data. Um, so there's a number of things that just influence the process when you're working with a population that is in treatment for addiction for substance use disorder. But anyways, 33 was our final number. 33. And Adam, um, you know, what would you say to somebody who's watching this or listening to the podcast who is really in the depths of despair mm. at the end of their addiction, as it were, and it could really go one of two ways and they can only see the dark side of it. What would your message be to that person? That's such a, it's such a personal question. Uh, and it's such a, it's such a tough thing because not only, um, did, uh, um, did I almost lose my battle with substance use disorder? I, I have, I've had six friends who have lost their battle with substance use disorder. Um, and so if you're a person uh, who is, who is struggling right now, what I want you to know is that I, I know how it feels. I know how you're feeling and I know how alone it feels. And I want you to know that 
more so than anything, um, I want to remind you that you matter, that you matter to this world, that you matter to somebody in this world, and that there is somebody who will experience an unbelievable sense of loss if you were to leave this world. And the reason why you matter is because you are a valuable person, that you have something of value to share with other people. And the world is waiting for you. And in fact, we're holding place for you. We're holding place for you in the hopes that you will reach out and just ask for help because we're not going to be able to solve this problem for you. What we're going to help you do is take the first step. And if you're willing to do that, and if you're willing to say, I don't know how to do it and I'm afraid, and that's okay, I'm going to figure this thing out as I go along. There are people, there are, there are organizations, there are support groups that will continue to help you take the next necessary step. And just know that however bad it feels for you right now, there are far better options to you in life than there are not being alive. And please reach out, call a friend, don't ask them what to do. Just say, I need someone to talk to because I'm trying to figure this thing out and I don't know how to do it. Call a support group, say, I don't know what to do. I just need to know what to do next. Um, and never give up on yourself. Uh, you, have, you have no idea what potential lies for your future or lies in your future. I can tell you that for me, I cannot believe that I almost ended my life right before the best part of my life ever began. And I know that that's probably the situation for you. Ted talk, man. You just have a way <laughs> of words and just uh, getting just right to the heart of the matter, man. Thank you so much for, for sharing. I think that you guys have really inspired a lot of people today. I know that I feel inspired. I love what you've done with this study. I'm so proud that we're able to talk about it here on the show. And I'm sure that there are a lot of people who are watching and listening who want to be able to connect with you guys. Adam, I know that you just launched a new website, adamsud.com. Talk to us about that. Yes. Yeah, so I just launched a website um, and it's really a collection of a lot of my interviews is on there, a collection of the podcasts I've done. Um, there's an opportunity to uh, book me as a speaker to come because I love uh, uh, giving presentations on my story or on the state of addiction and recovery. Um, there's an opportunity to work with me personally. Um, I do a concierge style of coaching service for people who are looking to use nutrition as a way to reorganize their life. Um, and so there's a lot of cool stuff and it's a continuing, there's going to be a, a continuing blog section and everything, but it's basically like a landing page for everything that I'm involved in. And you're a busy guy. No doubt about that, man. I think that there's a lot of people who could benefit from, uh, getting in touch with you and Dr. Kemp, I know, uh, you've got a website. You are very busy beyond the study as well. What do you have cooking in your kitchen? Yeah. So reconnect collective is my home base. Um, <clears throat> this is basically a, a space where we house programs and resources that guide women to do the inner work to heal their relationship with food, body, and self. And I have a retreat coming up, uh, first week of April that I'm very excited about if anyone's interested in that. And then, um, shortly after that, we'll be opening up the doors for the next cohort of my signature coaching program, Reconnect Academy. It's a 12 week program. Um, and specifically for women. And yeah, that's, that's my love. That's where most of my time is going these days. Absolutely. Hey, look, I mean, you guys are just bringing so much good into the world in so many different ways. So I greatly appreciate with your busy schedules, uh, you guys willing to take the time to spread a little good here on the exam room. Okay. Oh, yes. Thanks so much for having us. So fun to be here. <laughs> If your health IQ was a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcast or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.